Can machines be creative? It's an interesting question. Creativity is wrapped up a lot in romance. Kind of there's this idea that um, creativity is kind of linked with the human spirit and expression, the kind of epiphany of thoughts and that kind of artist out to sea for some inspiration suddenly has that like blinding light going in their head and that idea strikes them. Well, there certainly is romance in being creative, but there is also a lot of stuff going on subconsciously that we're not aware of. There's a lot of processing, there's a lot of background noise going on inside our own brains, uh, influences that are affecting how we come up with ideas. And while creativity is romantic, I kind of find it quite romantic knowing how stuff works. So I quite like to know how creativity works. But then we hit our first sticker. What is creativity? And surprisingly, there are many definitions. But for the sake of this, I'm going to just give you a brief description of what I mean when I'm going to say creativity. It's really divided into two different types. Um, psychological creativity, me as an individual with all my experiences, can come up with a new idea that I myself have never ever had, but someone else might have had it. This is the fun problem of going to GitHub and having this really exciting project and going, oh, right, someone's already done that. Historical creativity is a bit of a bigger deal. Throughout the history of the human race, no one has ever had this thought before. So already, as humans, historical is a tiny, tiny percentage. It's the Leonardo da Vinci's, the Mozart's, the Bach's, who have had radical ideas that have fundamentally changed the way we function as humans. So historical is a very, very far goal for any sort of AI system. Psychological, maybe that's possible. We're starting with creativity. We start with these boundaries. And this circle represents the kind of creative space. The black boundary represents the rules, the grammar you have in your head that limits you in the way you express yourself. So let's take an example of like portrait painting. So within a portrait, there's already constrictions around the fact that you need a person. You might have a, like a, just a face shot. And all these various rules about what paint you use, what colors you use, kind of limits your creative space. And there's a couple of ways we can be creative, the way we can create ideas. So the first one is simple combination. We take two very well-known ideas, they don't have to be new, and join them such that they create a new concept. So this is pretty common in programming languages. I think of things like Ruby that took ideas from Smalltalk, Python, bits of Haskell, but lots of bits, and kind of joined these all together. They weren't necessarily new ideas, but it did create something new from joining those. The other is exploration. So I said we have this, this semantic space. Exploration is, with all the rules, trying to find every weird and wonderful possible thing you could express. So I think of this as like brainstorming. Now, in both these two forms of coming up with ideas, machines are brilliant at exploration space, at high permutation depth, exploring a massive number of permutations. And in terms of combination, again, that's a combinatorial problem. Machines can be pretty good at that. They can process a lot more than I could process. But the key essence is knowing when you found something of value. And that's the running challenge for AI, is to not just search, but to know when you've struck gold. The final form is perhaps the most coolest as humans. This is where you look at your own internal rules, adjust them, and change them such that you can express a new idea, a new concept that was impossible to express in the previous rules. You bend the space, you bend the rules. An analogy for this one, I think of kind of transitioning from something to the closure programming language, which I do a lot of. And suddenly, there's different ways of expressing ideas. There's sometimes ways of expressing things that you couldn't have expressed before. Very simple things that can have quite a dramatic effect on the ideas and how creative you can be. So there's a brief overview of creativity. Now let's explore 
how machines can be creative and what currently exists. One of the um, most interesting, I guess, leaps in AI creativity was understanding the importance of entropy and chaos. This um, came from an idea of training a neural network with every possible movement that the human body could make, kind of a dance as such. And then by introducing, uh, slowly killing those connections while the neural network was running, you introduced a little bit of chaos, a little bit of randomness. If you think about that kind of transformational um, creativity, suddenly the system was doing stuff that we didn't tell it to do. It's making associations that we didn't tell it to do. And because we're kind of only killing a couple of neurons, it has a very spiked effect. It's still following a lot of the rules, but suddenly those rules have changed slightly. And from this came um, what they called the death dance, which I'll show you. I still keep challenging someone to actually try and do this. It should be possible, but I'm not going to do it now. Kind of beautiful, I think. Our next artist is Aaron. Aaron is a painter. Aaron mixes his own paintbrushes, um, cleans their brushes, and um, often is left running overnight painting on a canvas with a brush. I think kind of doing about 10 to 20 pictures overnight. People seem to be obsessed with the detail that Aaron cleaned its own brushes. Here's an example of some of the pieces of, I say, art that Aaron has made. The creator is um, Harold Cohen, and the idea for Aaron came from something very simple. He was wandering, um, I'm not sure, in a national park of some kind, and came across some very basic cave paintings. And he wanted to answer the question, when do some marks on a wall become a figure, become a picture. And like good computer scientist, he completely obsessed with that for 40 years and built Aaron. Aaron is based on one core idea, that what we store inside our brains is a, much, uh, is a reduced representation of the constructs we have in this world. So the example of this is when you look at me, Actually, for the first split second, or even more small than split second, what you see is my shape. You see the outline of a human being. And then your categorization in your head is, okay, that's a human, and then you start filling in the details, looking at all the other various details. So the idea with Aaron is by having a very simple representation of objects in the world, that's enough for it to project and start creating and painting. To give you an example of how Aaron functions, it starts, um, for example, there's, a, there's an element of randomness initially about what it's going to paint, but that is heuristically weighted in that it's not going to paint a ginormous head on the canvas because it knows that's going to make it very hard to fit other things into the picture to add to the composition. So it starts with the idea of I want to paint a figure. It knows the figure has a body, a head, arms, legs. It moves on to the next step of, okay, those aspects of the human have different ratios. It could be thin, fat, large, lots of various aspects, which again, it's going to decide upon. Then it moves on to positions that the human body can move. It needs to know every possible position that a human could move in in order to accurately create a human. And finally, it thinks about the environment, uh, gravity. So the simple idea that if a character was standing in a strange position looking like they would be floating in midair, we would have a strange, it would have a strange feel to it. Um, funnily enough, one of the hardest things that Aaron actually did, I'm sure if my laser pointer is working that well here, is in the very top, um, occlusion, the idea of having one person behind another person, is actually a, a very difficult concept and came quite far in um, Aaron's progression. I think these pieces, I'm not sure which ones, but I know some of them have hung in the MoMA in uh, San Francisco and have been around a couple of galleries. Again, lots of contention over whether this is art and whether this is creativity. Now I'm kind of fun to explore what's out there, but I want to dig a little deeper and explore music and see how far we can get in creating something that may create creative music. There's a lot of creatives in there. I should precursor this with, I am absolutely obsessed with sound. I, like every second of my life is full of music. 
but I have absolutely no pretension to create music at all. I'm still the scarred from the fact that no matter how hard I blew in a saxophone, it didn't make a sound, and this has stayed with me to my adulthood. So I cannot, for the life of me, create music. I'm very, very bad. So please, anyone who has any formal music training, come up to me afterwards and absolutely break me and rip me to shreds because I will learn so much from it and I'm open-minded about it. So join me with this journey. Hello and welcome to the wonderful world of sound. Notice I sound, not music initially at least. Complexity, a programmer's best friend. If we're creating music, maybe if we create something sufficiently complicated enough, we could argue that that could be creative. You know, I couldn't, when the complexity gets so great, I may not even be able to predict what it's going to generate. So let, let's try that as an avenue to explore. All these examples are written um, in Clojure using Overtone. I'm going to start with something very simple. Let's take a little bit of mathematics. Take cosine. And all we're going to do is there's not even any linearization. We're just going to take simple numbers that map to pitches and play them on a piano. Not really music. It had a, if, if thinking about that search space, it was literally following a directed path, right? There was no creativity there. Stellar automata are a fun way of creating very complex systems. So in here, there's just simple rules about whether cells live or die. Um, there's a representation um, I just created here where the dot means that a cell is alive. We always start with one cell being alive. And what we're going to do is map these two pictures on a piano. Oh, organ, sorry. Sounds very ominous. Again, it's, it's not really music. There's definitely a lot of complexity. There's a lot of symmetry. Uh, Overtone gives us a way to tell the computer shut up, which is going to be very useful for this presentation. Let's jump in and have a brief look at what um, the cellular automata looks like. It's simply a set of rules about stars and zeros, indicating whether three stars dies, two stars live, and I played around with lots and lots of different rules just to hear what they sounded like. And we just work out with a very simple one-dimensional grid that processes three by three by three by three to see whether cells live or die. I have another fun cellular autonomous rules that I kind of like. <laughs> to shut up. So let, let's try a different data set. This time I'm going to focus on a huge source of random data. So I'm going to take satellite data, I believe from uh, Mexico, and this is literally just a whole massive bunch of integer values. I'm going to linearize these onto piano pitches, and maybe that randomness would do something interesting. Interesting. It's nice to represent data as sound, but it's, again, not music. Maybe we can use something that has a better probability distribution that might be more effective as music. Words are pretty good. We have a consistency of vowels. So I can take these words and letters and map them to pictures. So this is what a strange loop sounds like. Very ominous. <laughs> it's literally like each character maps uppercase, lowercase, maps to a pitch. And again, we discover something interesting here. The word potato has a beautiful pitter patter to it. It's again like a good probability distribution. There's definitely some of that order is bringing us something closer to music, but we're still quite a long way away. So complexity has given us something interesting, but I wouldn't call it music yet. Perhaps we try another path and capture humans, because humans are supposed to be creative, right? So maybe if we can capture some of that essence in a machine, it might start to sound more like music. 
I start with a neural network. That's a great way of encoding a lots and lots of users' um, representations of feelings towards music. This is constructing a very simple progression of notes and graded on how pleasant people found the transitions. It's getting better. We're definitely moving towards a pattern, but it lacks a lot of human feel. Markov chains uh, using probability models are also a great way of encapsulating part of a human's use of music. Just creating a probability tree based on what the previous notes were and using that to try and decide what the future notes will be. Uh, I have a couple of examples, just a very simple one, using, I think, like six or seven notes. But we need a big data set for this to be useful, so instead I'm going to use a bunch of music by Buck. I have a file here with a breakdown by pitch and by time of a lot of Buck music. And I'm going to use this to create a probability tree, which I'm then going to generate music from. Initially, I'm only going to use a single note. So it's only based on the previous note to decide how this music sounds. And I also give it the first note so it can actually start. bum notes there still. What we can do is expand the depth of our Markov chain. So rather than considering one note, consider three notes. We get closer fit to Bach, so we're closing that exploration space, but we're becoming better focused on what's good. Again, it's about assessing the value of whether we're finding interesting things or not. Definitely making progress, but it's a very tight fit, right? I mean, again, we're just using Bach's genius to try and reshuffle into music. An interesting idea, but it's still not getting us a lot of things. All these solutions really, we've kind of encoded lots of rules which the machine is executing. We haven't really created anything that's making leaps, that's making bounds, that's discovering new things. I got obsessed with this idea of, um, it, it's an idea that was created by, I believe, the inventor of the air harp, he created that for Bjork. He had a couple of ideas about how you could take the human subconscious and use that to generate music and also use it to control music. And I thought this would be kind of fun to try. So just out of curiosity, I acquired a test subject. Um, it took a while, but uh, this is my daughter. And I decided to, very, very briefly, I wouldn't recommend doing anything like this for any sort of amount of time, very, very briefly decided to scan her brainwaves. And something very, felt very good about the fact that she would generate brainwaves, which would feed into the computer, the computer would play back near instantaneous music to her, that would affect her brainwaves, which would change, and there's this quite beautiful loop going on, right? a little bit like our subconscious mind. I use um, a little Python script, which is taking data off a EEG machine that I actually have sitting over there, um, and it's feeding that via a socket. In fact, I'll grab it. Just to make you think I don't just put my daughter through this, I'll do it as well. Let's see how this thing goes on. I think this looks better than Google Glasses. So it connects over the socket, and then it's pushing um, data to closure, where I'm just reading them through the name socket. And there's a huge amount of information here, so there's infinite fun to be had playing with this. But at the moment, I'm just doing a linear map, which turns out to be not that effective. More interesting things about power laws. but And I'm also mapping the attention, because I figure a small child has very little attention, so it might be more interesting. And this is what my daughter's brain sounds like. It's kind of fun, but it, it's a wave, right? And turning a wave into a music is actually a pretty hard problem. 
you got to be a bird here. So a bit of fun, but uh, again, it's, it's hard sometimes to turn data into music. So this is where I turn to the, um, I guess, the leaders and experts in musical creativity, which is David Cope, um, the author of these two books, Computer Models of Musical Creativity and Virtual Music, Computer Synthesis of Musical Style. And these are going to take us in leaps of bounds to actually get even closer to what might be creative music. From this, we're going to define an integrated model of musical creativity. The very first step is probably defining what of some of David Cope's ideas are around music. His theory is that no music comes about from nothing, from a vacuum. In fact, originality in music is often about composing other influences in such a way that they create a new, new unique sound. And through this, we can use illusions. This is a very simple, well, very simple, it's reasonably simple, script that will take a source data set. Uh, in this example, we're going to use a bit of music from Chopin. And we'll try and find influences from other composers. So I have a whole bunch of uh, composers here. It's going to generate um, not comparisons by pitches, but by comparison by intervals. And from this, we can start to get a little insight into perhaps how Chopin was influenced. I'll jump to the music. So the top score represents Chopin's original piece, and each other piece is the pattern that matched with Chopin's music. And this could give evidence to suggest that Chopin was influenced by Bach, Beethoven, and various other composers. This is interesting in kind of moving with um, David Cope's theory of music is a recombination of existing forms of music. But it also provides a very powerful way of merging different sources of music. We saw in the Markov chain how we kind of did just took Bach's music and used that to generate new music. Using some sort of pattern matching system, we can take two diff disparate sources of music. And by finding a pattern that may match, that may be influenced, we might find a good point to take those two pieces of music and join them together. So this can be a very effective way of taking multiple sources of information, of data, of music, and merging them such that we can create something new. The next one we'll look at is recombinants, which we kind of looked at a little bit with Markov chains. In this example, I'm going to take um, Bach's Choral 140, break it down into individual beats, a beat, just a couple of notes, or play together a chord, and simply shuffle them around and pick a random order, which would obviously sound absolutely terrible because random order would just not work. So we need a direction, like the Markov chains, which use just pitch. We need some way of knowing that the music is progressing. One way of doing this is using the leading voice, trying to find a nice flow with the various notes. Do this by, for every single beat, storing, um, I guess, a little data set, which indicates the notes that beat starts with and the destination notes, the next beat, what those notes were. And from this, we can kind of construct this nice little representation um, of voice leading, which is just comparing the start and the destination notes to create something that's easy to look at. For this example beat, which starts with 5, 3, 5, 7, 6, 2, 6, 5 pitches, I talk in pitches because that's actually the only part of music I really understand. Um, we have ideas about what beats that could map to. There's uh, like three or four examples there of beats. And from this, we can then start to construct beats using voice leading. We might get an interesting flow better than the Markov chain. And this is an example. So I'm going to just run through uh, using Bach's Coral number 140. I load a huge database um, broken up into beat groupings just because I used functions or defs for my data because data is code and code's data. But there is a limit to the size of a function. So yeah. <laughs> Simple, these are all MIDI notes. I'm not going to detail MIDI notes, but uh, it's all using a piano. They have different velocity involved as well. I load the data set. It actually takes quite a while. Eh, not too bad. I get lots of Neil's useful response. But it's now created an entire database broken up in beats. And the music. Each 
each of these outputs here represents a beat group and the specific beat within that group. So you can see not just my word for it, that this is mixing and matching a lot of beats. And I think, you know, I've actually listened to some of the pieces this generated, and I kind of like it. Something beautiful about it. But again, it's taking Bach's influence. I cheated, though. And this is a recurring theme of creativity. Um, when I showed you Aaron, the painter, it generates 50 or 10, 20 pictures overnight. And then Harold Cohen goes and looks and picks the best ones. So there's a human there, right? There's a human helping the machine select what might be good. That problem I told you about at the beginning of the hard problem is knowing when you've hit gold. A, machine, a human is helping in that example. Um, in this example, I discovered that there was something just not quite right with the pitch distance. Every now and then, some couple of pitches crashed. And as a human, this was like instantaneous to me. I instantly got, yes, there's something not right there. And it was very easy for me to fix. Something as a pattern of creative machines is there's this ineluctable small little kind of bundle of random humanness that's incredibly hard to put down to a machine. And none of the people I'm talking about are claiming that they've created a completely isolated black box that is capable of creativity. Humans are involved. And just to show you what I did and happily hold my hand up, this is what it sounded like before I cheated. It's not too bad, but it's bad. Yeah. It's, it's just uh, so, so many things, and it took so, so long to write that. It was, I was quite happy with it for a little bit. We've looked at very specific data sets about like Bach. Um, we've kind of haven't really captured that aspect of creativity of all the influences of when you took that bus journey home, that thing you heard in the radio, the thing you listened to on your um, phone, all those various influences that come into as a part of creativity. And, you know, just taking a source of Bach isn't really doing anything that, you know, bringing lots of new different data sources. So one simple idea is to create a bot that goes out, crawls the internet, and finds all MIDI files. It then does a little bit of validation on those MIDI files and uses them to influence various pieces of music. At the very simplest level, we can kind of use that recombinance technique, but with lots of different sources. I've got a couple of MIDI files that I went out and searched for and found. MIDI is a horrible platform. Nothing you hear is actually normally MIDI. It's coming through overtone, makes it sound nice. pretty bad again, but there's something very interesting going on there blending genres. So you can see how we could take that further in um, actually having a tighter refinement on what we select. But I had absolutely no idea that it would pick those pieces of music. And that's interesting in discovering something new from the machine that I never actually programmed it explicitly to do. The final ones I want to touch on are probably the most important that David Cope has um, implemented. Learning and inference. Nothing we've done so far has learnt. Learning is part of improving, part of getting better. And inference is that key step in taking a jump that might produce something new but isn't necessarily sound. Graduus is a canon builder. And it uses a very simple depth search with a number of rules about what a valid canon is. And as it progresses, it stores rules that it found problematic and in future runs will avoid them. So this is a very simple example. It actually wasted a lot of time trying to generate these results with the search. Oh, yeah, we have lots of different sources as well we can use for these. But... If I fire it up again after I've done overtone to shut up, we can run it again, and it will build an even better canon, because it's learnt now a number of rules, 
about paths that it shouldn't follow, paths that it should follow, building up notes that worked, notes that didn't work. It's encoding inside itself a set of rules about canon. It's learning. The other one, um, inference, is the key to what we'll see in a second. These are simple predicates about notes. GBD, CE are dominant tonic. Dominant tonic are resolutions. FAC, CEG are subdominant tonics. Subdominant tonics are resolutions. It's great. Like, I don't understand any of those words, but I understand logic and inference, so I can actually understand what's going on. So these simple ideas, we can now ask the machine to do something, give us an analogy for GEB. And don't worry, you can't quite see it down there, but it's got the fact that that notes GBD, CEG, the relationship between those two notes, and FAC and CEG are related. This is absolutely fundamental to what we're going to look at now. Um, the idea of building up not just predicates, though, but building up an association network, of adding weights to those associations. David Cope very much looks at his, um, his work with the composer we'll look at as more of like of jamming, of like giving it a set of notes and it kind of responding, and then him going, no, I didn't like that, I did like that. But with that inference step, it can take um, it can take preconditions and come to new conclusions that aren't necessarily sound, and that is absolutely key in creating something that's creative. And this is where I step aside slightly and show you um, what a lot of these theories we've discussed build um, with David Cope's creation, which has um, released a CD as well, Emily Howe. Um, I'll let you listen for a second. I think this is beautiful. And it's using a lot of the techniques we've talked about, about recombinance. There's a lot more there, but I'm happy to discuss and dive into later. So I've kind of taken you on a little journey through art, through music. There's lots of other work in poetry, um, lots of other fun things about creativity. But I kind of want to come back and the question that I threw out when I started, can machines be creative? And we should let Ada Lovelace lay a little bit of truth on us. A machine, it can do whatever we know how to order it to perform and has no pretension whatsoever to originate anything. This makes sense. Everything I've shown you has been based on source music, has been taking existing music and trying to build music from it. David Cope's very hypothesis that music is based on combining various other pieces of music and other styles together fits with that, right? Um, I kind of guess I would argue in the response to this is no human being has any pretension to originate music if they have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of music. I could not possibly begin to create any of the piece of music you've sound if you just put a piano in front of me. Um, I've been teaching myself musical theory along the way, and it's been painful. But she does have a point, but maybe it's the fact also that creativity doesn't come from a vacuum. It comes from existing input, existing stimuli. And maybe if we create complicated enough systems, they may do things we don't expect with serendipity, discovering new sources of influence. The not conscious argument is a hard one as well. Consciousness is often argued as a fundamental for creativity. You need to be able to reflect on the rules of the system. You need that transformational creativity. You need to be able to redefine the rules and come up with new ideas. And it, it's, it's agreed the machine is, while it's not conscious, it's taking a lot from the, conscious, the subconscious model, and it is reflecting, it is learning. It's just not at a human level. It's at a very tightly defined um, scope. So we may be simulating consciousness, but it's also tying the fact that maybe we don't need consciousness to be creative. Maybe the human way of being creative isn't the only way to be creative. This one always makes me sad. I do I like a lot of work in AI, and this, this, this idea that 
all this beautiful code that you've written and sculpted and wonderful variable names and beautiful fluidity, the machine has absolutely no understanding of that. All that detail is for humans. The machine has no, no idea. And again, to me, this falls on that common trait of assuming that it has to do things the human way. A machine doesn't know what your variable names mean, but at a very low level, it has an idea what a, what a jump is, what a condition is, comparisons, operators, left shift, right shift. These very, very low level things are something the computer does understand, does have meaning to it. And I would argue that that is operating at some level of meaning. It's not the human level, but again, I'm not sure being human is enough to just say that's the only thing that's able to be creative. The hardest, and the one that I can't possibly begin to answer, that, that beginning thing about romance, about the fact that machines are the only things that can be creative. Oh, sorry, humans are the only thing that can be creative. Sorry, it's past my coffee time, and it's, it's midnight. Yay. Um, so non-humans non can't be creative. It takes human to be creative. And you can use that definition, but I kind of think this is a little bit sad. I've hopefully shown you some music that at least I think is very, very beautiful. And to deny that its place in art seems to me like rather short-sighted. It's a beautiful piece of work. I, I don't listen to art or watch art or view art for creativity. I view it to be, have emotions and to explore what that work does in my own mind. It doesn't need a human to do that. I said creativity has many definitions. And coming back to my original question, can machines be creative? Well, it depends on what definition you use of creativity, which kind of implies that we don't really understand what creativity is which also kind of implies we don't really understand what's going in our subconscious mind. So my original point of can machines be creative is kind of like me saying this thing that we don't really understand, machines can do that, which doesn't make sense. So I can't argue that machines are creative because I don't know what creativity is. People do not have an absolute definition of creativity. What I can tell you is the machines can create. And what they create is, is, is not bound by the ability of the programmer. I told you I cannot, for the life of me, create music, but I managed to make machines that could maybe get near to generating music. So my ability as a musician was not impacted. It was my ability to express ideas. And that's interesting. When it comes to creativity, it's not the machine that has the limitation. It's the human that has the limitation. It's really about my own creativity in my head and the ideas that I come up with to express to a machine how it could go about creating music. And there's something kind of beautiful there as well about exploring our own subconscious and trying to be as creative as possible to create a machine that can create beautiful things and maybe feed off our creativity. It's really an insight into our subconscious mind. And David, uh, sorry, uh, Harold Cohen, um, all these people um, have discovered amazing things about their art form. Um, Harold Cohen spent three years teaching Aaron to um, mix colors. And he realized after these three years that it was a mixing color is just about lightness and darkness. He had known this subconsciously since he started painting, but he could not express this to a machine because it was that subconscious expertise. So a part of creating machines is, again, understanding and exploring our own subconscious. If you could do me the favor of listening for the next 10 seconds or so, and I put this question to you. If this machine is not creating art, what is it? And other than origin from something a human creates, how is it different? If it's not thinking, what is it doing? And if you think you are thinking, what are you doing and how is it different? Let that float with us.
Thank you very much.